Oh, it's blown already. So we all set then? Okay. Hi guys, so um, as was said, I'm Michael Bauer. I'm a second year student at the University of Michigan studying computer science. Um, you can check me out on GitHub at BauerM97 or feel free to send me an email if you have any questions. I'll hopefully answer within a week, maybe. Um, so today I'm going to be talking a bit about Singularity. Uh, here's our website, singularity.lbl.gov. You can go here and check it out if you want. Uh, we also we have a page on GitHub. And here are the authors. So the project is led by Greg Kurtzer at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, and then the, sort of the four main developers besides him are Brian, Krishna, myself, and Vanessa. Uh, and then you can see here we have also a list of, of sort of significant contributors to the project as well. So uh, since Singularity is a software about containers, I thought I would start and talk just a little bit about what exactly are containers. And to do this, I want to ask the question, what is a virtual machine? So. Uh, Wikipedia is going to define virtual machine just as some emulation of a computer system. And they go on to say they're based on computer architectures and they provide full functionality of a physical computer. Uh, and a couple examples you might be familiar with VMware, VirtualBox, KVM, etc. Uh, so virtual machines, they're actually really nice. They provide a lot of really nice benefits for users. So kind of first and foremost is you can run different operating systems on one set of hardware. And that's sort of the main benefit. Um, so for instance, back when I was a kid in, in middle school, this was really cool. My dad was running Mac OS X on his laptop, and then I could run Windows in his Mac and play games that I otherwise couldn't play. Uh, and another really nice thing is they're really easy to maintain. You know, if you have a virtual machine, something goes wrong, you can just delete it and start again, get a new one. You know, uh, With hardware, it's maybe not so easy. Send it into an Apple store, and they charge you $300 to repair it. However, they're not perfect. Uh, two of the things that you'll notice using virtual machines, uh, one, slower performance, so maybe 5 to 10% slower depending on the virtual machine or the hardware. And also, you're going to have some additional memory and storage requirements. For instance, you know, with a virtual machine, maybe you need 20 gigabytes of space on your disk to store it. And that brings me kind of to my point, what are containers? So containers are sort of similar to virtual machines in that it allows us to sort of encapsulate an environment into one file. However, containers don't have any sort of kernel emulation, so there's no architecture virtualization going on. Uh, instead, it's just uh, sort of software. We're swapping out the environment. Uh, what this means is we can do sort of uh, this sort of emulation of a different environment without spending an extra 5% of performance. Uh, you're going to see containers, uh, they're going to be around 500 megabytes as a sort of a medium to large size container versus 20 gigabytes for maybe a typical virtual machine. As well, we're going to see there's going to be a very small startup time to actually get using your containers. So with, with the container, you can maybe expect about one second or with Singularity, less than a second to start up. Whereas with a virtual machine, you might waste one, two, five, ten minutes waiting for it to start up. Another really important point with containers is that multiple instances of a container can share one image. So here I have uh, sort of a picture, this is from Docker actually, of how the image is set up. And what you can see is Docker is built on sort of a layer system. These four layers here are read-only layers. They're each actually just an archive. And they build on top of each other, and they're all read-only. So every time you run an instance of a container, you're going to get in sort of the same four read-only layers, and they're all going to share this read-only layer. At the top, what we have is a small, thin read-write layer that each instance of the container will have a unique one. So if you have five containers, there's going to be five unique read-write layers, and they might each be one or two to five megabytes, depending on what you actually are doing in them. So containers these days, they're most typically being used in industry. So being used to store for, for services, databases, web servers, etc. And I want to talk about containers uh, in scientific computing. So I think there's a really big need for containers in sort of high performance scientific computing. And 
it's kind of a couple big reasons that I was personally searching for containers for the HPC system I was working at in Darmstadt. Uh, the first and foremost was to escape dependency hell. I'm sure we're all familiar with that, and this is kind of what brings us here to the Easy Build user meeting, is that we want to not have to worry about managing other people's software and avoiding conflicts and all the hassle around that. Your second main benefit to containers and high performance computing is that you're going to have some local code and you want to be able to execute that on your machine and then be ensured that when you send it over to the cluster it's going to execute the same way every single time. And a third also very important benefit for high performance computing and science in particular is that it's going to be one file that contains everything and that you can move anywhere. So especially with scienti for scientists this is a really important point because it allows you to sort of take one file that you've used to generate your, your results uh, and you can, if you're publishing a paper, you could, for instance, submit this file with your paper and tell people, hey, this file contains everything we use to make our results. Feel free to take our code and, and run with it and play with it and see that you can reproduce our results. So here, here is a, a graphic that I'm sure some of us are familiar with. You, you run code on your local machine here. It works. You run code not on your local machine here, on your, your high performance computer, in the cloud, whatever, and all of a sudden you're not working. So I've, I've sort of highlighted four needs, and these, this was kind of the checklist that we were going through um, at the GSI in Darmstadt when we were looking for our container system for high performance computers. So first and foremost, you, need, you want any user to be able to run containers, otherwise it's just not going to work. Uh, number two, you need to be able to integrate this seamlessly into infrastructure. So uh, we didn't want to use, uh, you know, Kubernetes and, and have to add additional infrastructure to what we already had. We don't want to waste manpower figuring that out and deploying that and prototyping and testing that. Uh, third of all, you want it to be portable between many systems. So uh, a really important thing is that you want to be able to have container software installed on any high performance computing center and then just ship your container between them and you don't have to worry about the implementation details of the software because it's just deployed on all sorts of resources. And fourth, you want to be able to have users bring their own containers with no administrative oversight and just kind of, you want the container software to be agnostic about what's in there. It should just be safe by default. So the first thing I investigated, I investigated Docker. I'm sure everybody is probably familiar with Docker in some respect. Um, Docker is the industry standard for containers. So we went through through the checklist and you know, first one, okay, checks the box. The second problem, okay, that was kind of a problem for us because for Docker properly, we were probably gonna have to look at some sort of different scheduling manager to what we were already using, which was Slurm. Um, third, it's portable between many systems. Yeah, Docker fulfills that. And, and fourth, users can bring their own containers. Yeah, Docker fulfills that too. For us, this was kind of a problem, especially number two, because number two, we really needed to ensure, oh, my check mark disappeared. <laughs> anyway, but so number two, that was kind of important for us. We didn't want to waste that manpower and that effort trying to figure it out. So that kind of ruled Docker out. And also at the same time, uh, this, this first box here, the check mark that was supposed to be there right now, uh, isn't sort of totally true. So with Docker, the issue actually ended up being that we had a root level daemon running and so the IT security guys actually just told us, no, it's never going to happen even if you want it to happen. So that really ruled out, ruled out Docker really, really quickly. Uh, so that, that actually brought us to find Singularity. We discovered Singularity sort of in October and uh, Singularity is, is built for high performance computing. It's, sort of container software just for HPC. So if you look back at our checklist, we can see Singularity is going to fill in all of the sort of the major boxes. So you know, any user can run it with, without special privileges. It's going to integrate right into your architecture. Uh, it's portable between many systems. And in fact, uh, with Singularity, we have users now running on something like kernel 2.6 still. Uh, and fourth, user created and provided containers. The, Really, anybody can bring any container, and we don't really worry about what's inside the container because they're not going to be able to do anything nasty that they wouldn't already be able to do. 
So with sing Singularity, any container, again, can be run by any user. When you run a container with Singularity, you're going to be the same user inside the container as you are on the host. So there's no sort of, um, there's no new user namespace inside the container, what Docker does, so you're not going to have root privileges inside your container. Um, for us, it was really nice because we had no workflow changes at all necessary. And in fact, with Singularity, we have a Slurm plugin. I don't know if, if is Slurm used here on site. Yeah. And so Singularity directly actually integrates into Slurm. And so if you're using Slurm, it becomes that much easier to use Singularity. And so that was actually a huge plus for us. Um, also with Singularity, it's just one single IMG file. Um, so you're going to have an IMG file. It's typically two to 500 megabytes in size. That is your container. You put that on some distributed file system, and then you can just run it anywhere. And four, it's safe to run any container. It doesn't matter what's inside the container. The user's never going to be able to do anything that they weren't already able to do. And so because of, of that last fact, uh, actually our IT security guys, in, in one day they said, okay, yeah, we can install it. It's fine. There's no issue. So uh, some of you may or may not have heard of Shifter or Charlie Cloud. These are sort of the two competing... Um, containers so solutions designed for high-performance computing. Uh, Shifter and Charlie Cloud, they're both built on top of Docker and they directly rely on Docker for functionality. Uh, well, and a couple of things, you can see I have some stars here that I want to highlight. Uh, these are some really important points for uh, scientific computing in particular. One, native support for GPUs inside your container. Singularity provides that where the others don't do so good. I think actually Shifter might be able to support GPUs in the containers now, but I'm not sure about that. Uh, two, native support for InfiniBand. As you can see, Docker really doesn't provide that. Singularity and the others, yeah, we do. And then also native support for MPI. So the three ones developed just for HPC, they fulfill that. Docker, not so much. Also with Singularity, there is some upstream support for it in OpenMPI 2.1, I think. So adoption of Singularity has been actually really good so far. So there's some, some really good names to have on here. MIT, Stampede, Stanford, uh, Purdue, University of Michigan, uh, GSI Helmholtz Center, um, University of Ghent are all already running Singularity on their systems. And also, if, you, if you're curious to read more about technical details about Singularity, we submitted a paper in PLOS One on December 19th. Hopefully that would be ready for publishing soon, but if, if you're interested, you can read more about that at some point. So now I want to go into more of usage of Singularity and how we're going to actually make use of it. So in my mind, we can split the, the workflow for Singularity up into three parts. You have your creation process where you actually make the physical file on the disk, and you do that with sudo singularity create and then give it an image name, and it'll magically create a file on your disk for you. The second part is the bootstrap part. This is kind of the special sauce of Singularity. This is where most of the interesting stuff will actually happen. Uh, so as you can see, it contains this definition file here. And what that is is a set of rules for how to build your image. So it will contain everything uh, for installing packages, setting up configurations. All of that will be done in this step right here. And then the third part is running your image. So there are three ways to actually run an image. You have Singularity Shell, which will just open up an interactive shell inside the image. Uh, Singularity Exec, which will execute any executable that you want it to inside the container. And then Singularity Run. And this is also the same as just you can directly execute the image itself. So what, that, what these two here do is there's a script that's inside the container called the run script, which is defined in your definition file. Um, and every time you use one of these two commands at the bottom here, it'll actually just run that script inside the container. So it provides sort of default behavior for your container. So just, just to kind of showcase how simple that process can be. I'm going to show a quick demo that I recorded earlier 
of actually going through the process. So you see my singularity.def file just contains um, that I'm going to be bootstrapping from Docker. I'll create an image, physical image file on the disk and tell it to do 568 megabytes of size. And you see it's got created right there. And then next up is bootstrapping. And so I'm going to tell it to bootstrap this image file that I just created using the definition file that you can kind of see up here. And you'll see what it does is it downloads the layers from Docker, builds them together, and is done. And now we can, we can use our container to actually execute stuff. And so I open up a shell. You can see now I'm inside the container. The, the PS1 changed. Singularity supports um, a couple different types of formats of containers. So the, f the first and foremost is, is the image file, what I just showcased there. Um, the second of all, we can support just a regular directory. If you have a file system stored in a directory, you can just directly run a container and point Singularity to your directory, and it'll run the container that way. Uh, and then it also has a support for sort of a range of, of archives and it essentially is just similar to directory. It'll just extract it, cache it, and then run it. So next up, I want to showcase uh, Singularity support for Docker. So we actually, since a lot of people already use Docker and a lot of people already have predefined workflows in Docker, we support Docker directly and natively. And what this means is that not just can you create an image using the base of Docker, but you can actually uh, directly call on the Docker API and run an image sort of at runtime without creating it yourself. And so you'll see uh, sort of without root privileges, I'll just run singularity shell and then I'll call on, on Docker and I'll ask for Ubuntu. Uh, and also supports tagging, so it's kind of, it's fully functional. And you can see all it'll do is now it's gonna just directly from Docker Hub, it's gonna download the layers of the image and it's going to store them in a cache directory. This one takes a couple minutes because I did this on really bad hotel Wi-Fi. Let's see if I can find the end of it. There we go. So it finishes downloading and, and boom, now we're inside of a shell. Now it would be really annoying if it had to kind of go through this downloading process every single time you want to run uh, directly from Docker. Uh, and so as you'll see in a second, I'm going to go out of the container and I'm going to rerun the previous command. And this time you notice that it's just going to be instant. It'll be five seconds. And all it does is it verifies that, that the files are still present and they still match the, the hash that Docker provides. And so what, what actually is going on is we store the Docker layers into a temp directory. Uh, we just cache them. And then every time you, you run after the first download, every time you run after the first download, you're going to see that it's just going to come up instantly. And so if you're running you know, 20 instances on one host, one of them will download it, and then they will all run just using the same sort of base layers. So as I was talking about earlier, um, we actually have direct Slurm integration. So we have a plugin written for Slurm. Uh, it's on our Singularity GitHub repository. You can download it there. It's really easy, really quick to set up. Uh, and to use it, all you have to do is you can just include this sbatch minus minus image line inside of a script. You give it uh, the location of an image. So in this case, the home directory, CentOS 7, uh, and then latest. And then everything that goes on in the script will happen as normal as you would expect, except you're just going to be running it from inside the container this time. So the main driving factor behind uh, my search for containers in high-performance computing was uh, at the GSI in Darmstadt, which is an Alice 2 2 center. And for those of you not familiar, uh, so this is kind of a diagram of, of what's going on with the Alice project. You have 
the ALICE detector at the LHC here generating data and it sends it out to each of these, some of the data out to each of these tier one centers in each of the member countries. And those tier one centers then will redistribute the data to the tier two centers for user processing and more. Uh, and this is where I worked here. We're a tier two center. That's our, our, our new supercomputing center that we're building. So this, this is our problem. We want to run Alice jobs uh, about 2,000 at any time. Uh, our host machines were running Debian 7 point something with the 316 kernel. This is where the issue arises. Alice experiments are expecting uh, scientific Linux 6. So the, the, the big problem with that is that there were a bunch of library incompatibilities between scientific Linux 6 and Debian 7.x. Uh, so kind of in order to fix that, we mount some correct library versions in Luster. Uh, then our, our Slurm job submission script actually got intercepted by some other script which uh, kind of mauled LD library path to point to unknown locations. Uh, they told me that more stuff was going on. Actually, I stopped paying attention because I had no idea what was going on at this point. Um, the main point to get out of this was this was just a big, ugly hack in every way possible and it was horrible. So what we did is we found Singularity. So this was our Singularity solution. This actually solved basically all of the issues that we were having. Uh, first off, we just packaged Scientific Linux 6 into a container. So you can see down here, so the Singularity build file will actually import the Scientific Linux 6 Docker container directly from upstream. So the Alice, uh, official Alice repository provides rules for this Docker container. Uh, we modify our Slurm submission script to run this Docker container that's built from the build file. Uh, we no longer needed to mount Luster, uh, so that actually cut off a dependency of ours because we had now the proper environment. Um, and maybe most importantly, we were able to test this, this entire ecosystem here locally before we deployed it out onto the HPC. So this here is kind of your basic command. So there are, there are some sort of administrative options at the top here just for um, modifiers. And then you have your you know, standard help. Uh, the container usage commands, you have exec, run, and shell, which I already talked about a little bit earlier. And then we also have test, which uh, as I'll talk about in a minute, so you can put test code in your container, which inside the container when you build the container, it'll actually run the test code and tell you whether or not your container was successfully built. And so I mean, you have to provide the code and then you can determine what means the container works or not. Then at the bottom here, these are sort of your container management commands. So uh, the first of all is, is the bootstrap, which we talked about. We also talked about create. So uh, copy, what copy does is it's sort of like an SCP. It allows you to copy some file from any location on your host just into the container that you want. And then also export and import, these are really nice. Uh, and these don't require root privileges, whereas so bootstrap and create do. And so with, with export, what you can do is you can just export the singularity container just directly to a tar archive. And import is you can import any container directly from a tar archive. And this is nice uh, if for some reason you want to just directly pipe from a docker export command. You can export from docker directly into a singularity container, and that just works just by piping it into the singularity import command. And then you can also do singularity mount and, and just mount the container image at some location on your file system, but not actually go into it. All right. So now I want to uh, go over to the singularity homepage. We're going to go a little bit through the documentation here. So you guys, if, if you want to, you can also follow along singularity.lbl.gov. Um, right. So first thing to notice, we can go to the, the top right here. There's a news category. If you want to uh, see what's going on in the world of Singularity, you can go up there. I'm going to go to the to the user guide in the documentation. And then 
we'll go down, we'll first, we'll start over at, at create an image. So this I've already kind of touched on quite a bit, but essentially it, it reiterates what I was talking about. You just pseudo singularity create and you create your image. And it also here, it talks about mounting an image so you can just mount it into some location on the file system. What I didn't talk about is that uh, you can expand your image. So as I had said earlier, you specify a size at the creation of the image. Uh, if you specify a size that's too small, you can expand it later. Now another thing that's, that's maybe important to mention is that uh, with Singularity, our containers are just by default read only. And the idea behind that is, is you don't want you know, two processes running on the same container instance and then modifying things and messing the other container up. So by default, they're always going to be read only. Uh, there, are, there are solutions, which I'll talk about again in a second, that allow you to read and write data from specified locations uh, for you know, producing output or taking input. The next important part about Singularity I want to talk about uh, in more depth is uh, the bootstrap definition file. So this is, this is kind of where you're going to be doing most of the work where you actually build your container. So we can split it up into four sections and a header. So the Singularity header is going to uh, contain sort of one keyword, uh, which is the bootstrap keyword, and it'll tell it how you want to build your container. So uh, first off, you can build it based on, on yum, Second of all, you can also build it on dbootstrap. You can build it on using Arch. Uh, our support for Arch Linux is not amazing at the moment, but you can do it. Uh, and then fourth of all is, is Docker. And I think uh, starting with Docker is maybe the easiest way to get involved with Singularity because someone else has already done the hard work of uh, using dbootstrap or yum to actually provision the base of the system. So this is what I find myself using the most. I just pull. I say docker, the bootstrap docker, and then I say from, and then you give it sort of a, a container name and a tag optionally. If you omit the tag, it'll just default to latest. And then include CMD will tell uh, Singularity whether or not you want to sort of retain default docker container behavior. So if you just run docker run and then give it the name of an image, it'll run some base default thing. And if you say include CMD yes, then it will do the same. If you say no or leave it blank, then it won't. Also, if, if you have a Docker container that's stored on a, a private registry, like a local version of Docker Hub, uh, you can actually still use that. You just specify the registry keyword, which will uh, be the location of the, new, the other registry. And then if you need a token to access it, so if it's actually encrypted, then you can provide token here as well and, and we'll take care of that and you'll still be able to get it. So on to the four sections of the bootstrap file. So first of all is setup and setup is run. It's a, just a shell script. So all of these coming up are just going to be just general shell scripts. Um, setup is run during bootstrap on the host outside of the container. So what that means is if, if you have some files on your host, that you just want to copy into the container, this is kind of the best place to do it. So you'll just you know, write CP from some location, and then if you want to actually go into the container, you can do that with this uh, environment variable here, singularity underscore root fs. Next up is the post section. Uh, it's basically the same thing, except for it's executed inside the container this time. And this is where most of, of the important stuff is going to go on. So this is where you're going to do app git install or yum install, uh, et cetera, you know, the provisioning of the actual container. And it's done inside the container. Third, we can look at the run script. So the run script is sort of analogous to the include CMD, which I talked about earlier. This provides default behavior for your container when you just directly execute it or do a singularity run. So you give it some, some script here. And as, as you can actually see, I haven't touched on that. But uh, command line arguments are just directly passed through. And so those work as expected as well. And then when you do like a direct execution of your image or you do singularity run image, 
then this is what will actually be run. And then lastly, we also provide the ability to put some test code into your container. This test code will run after the bootstrapping process is done. Uh, you know, you can put some something to make sure that your image works correctly and print some output to tell you if it worked or didn't work. Or if you sort of return a non-zero value, then it'll tell you, hey, something went wrong. Your image is broken. So another really uh, vital part of Singularity is talking about the mounting. So uh, we actually provide the ability to directly bind mount any location from the host into the container. And if we look down right here at where they actually, we actually showcase this, uh, it's really simple to do. You do Singularity, you give it some sort of uh, execution keyword, and then you specify minus big B, uh, give it a location on the host, colon and then location inside the container and then when you look at this location inside the container you'll actually just be looking at the location on the host and this is really nice so as I talked about earlier all singularity containers are read only by default uh, and what this means is that you can mount a read write location into your container and write data to it that might be uh, where you store your output or you know what have you So next, I want to uh, showcase uh, something called Singularity Hub. Get this to st Is that big enough? So Singularity Hub is sort of our equivalent to Docker Hub where you'll be able to, and actually currently you are able to uh, store your Singularity definition files on our website and then it, our website will actually build your container for you and then you will be able to download your container just onto your system and run it. So normally in order to bootstrap a container you're required to have pseudo privileges on a machine. With Singularity Hub what we can do is you just give us your definition file, we run it inside a VM, uh, we do all the building for you, and so you don't even need a machine with Linux in order to do this. You just submit the file, and then you can run this on, on a cluster if you don't have Linux. So, so what I have here in this directory is um, I have a git set up, and it's just one file, the singularity file. And it's actually the, the remote for this is just uh, on my GitHub account, which is directly linked to singularity hub. And if you look at sort of my account on singularity hub, uh, you can see this S hub test has a bunch of different builds on it. And every time that I actually submit uh, just I push something to the upstream to my github of this project I will get a new container generated from this file so if we look at the file right now uh, you can see it's just a really basic file here all it's doing is taking an Ubuntu container from docker and building it what I can do is I can throw something into the postscript so maybe uh, you know, make a test directory uh, and create some file. Uh, and, you know, maybe in, in our run script, uh, we can in our run script, we can tell it to tell us something. So now, you know, Git will tell us that we have a modified, a modified file. We'll update the file, commit it, and now we just push it 
to master and once this works you'll see on singularity hub as i refresh now all of a sudden we have a new build started and so um, in a second what will happen is this will change from pending to running uh, singularity hub on on the servers that we have it will fire up a virtual machine and it'll build exactly what the singularity definition file is uh, that what I just specified unfortunately it takes a minute so I don't know how long it'll even take it's still kind of in prototyping but what we can do is I can demonstrate running a singularity container based off of one of the previous versions that I built so In order to run your container, all we have to do actually is just do singularity sort of shell, tell it to pull from singularity hub, similar to what we did earlier in showing off Docker. Uh, and then you can see here the ID, uh, you can just take the ID of one of these builds. Um, I'll take 139, because that was, that was yesterday. And then run that. And you can see it'll, it'll find the image on singularity hub It'll download the image, and now I'm inside the container. Simple as that. And actually, eventually, once once this uh, most recent one updates and, and finishes building, we'll actually yeah. So it's it's in the process of building right now. Once that is built, then we would actually be able to run this and see the changes that we made uh, in that definition file come to life. So, um, that's all about, about all I have prepared. Uh, I have time for questions now. Right. Right, correct. As far as I'm aware, um, so I'm not actually developing this website. I, I have a little bit of input into it. Uh, the environment should be as clean as possible. Uh, there's also going to be uh, the ability to choose what builder you're using. And so in the future, this might contain things like Ubuntu, Debian, Scientific Linux, whatever, to choose what environment you want to build it in. Um, also, you can, you can see here, you can specify the image size. Uh, and touching specifically on, on the environment part going forward, I think, so we're going to be working to push a 2.3 release in end of March, early April. Uh, and what's going to happen is there's going to be sort of a new uh, rigid definition of how the environment is set up inside the container. Two point two. I mean, it's it's like. Right. It, it's fixed. I mean, this is still not technically like a, a release version of Singularity Hub. Right, I mean, according according to here, it's using uh, 2.2. Okay, so that, I mean, that could be. I'll just repeat the question next time then. But yeah, Rob, I mean, so I, I'm not sure exactly, like, exactly what version of Singularity it is, um, but if you, like, I know you're in our Slack channel. If you send a message to Vanessa, she can tell you specifically exactly what's going on there. As far as I'm aware, I mean, since this isn't, like, even production ready yet, it'll, it'll be 
you know, many different versions of singularity that you can select from. Right, right. Right, so, oh, right, so the question is, uh, how exactly is it handled? For instance, with InfiniBand, you really need to be running uh, a, a specific version of the InfiniBand driver that matches the right version for the host inside the container. Uh, so I would say the easiest way that we can do that is actually just mounting it, the, dri the specific drivers from the host that work on the host into the container. And then you have access to exactly what you're running on the host inside the container. Uh, we also have had, had users have success of just installing uh, identical versions of the drivers inside the container and then running that way. If you installed it into the container, if you're just mounting it into the container, it should be okay. That's how you set it up, but. What? I'm not sure. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. So, well, the question was support for Intel OmniPass? Yeah, and the answer is I don't know. I'm not sure about that. So, so the question is, um, since you're saying it's safe to run any containers, does that still apply when you're running containers from Docker Hub? And the answer is yes, because when you're having any container with singularity, uh, the permissions model that we have set up is such that you are still your user when you're inside the container. And so even if you have, you know, it doesn't matter what files are, are put into the container, so one, we mount with no SUID, so there's no set UID uh, files, in, binaries inside the container. So you can't exploit those. And two, if there's any sort of file owned by root that gets pulled down, uh, that won't really matter because you won't have access to use it anyway. Does that answer? So we don't do network namespaces, but uh, depending on, <laughs> the, the question is what kind of namespaces do you run your containers with? Uh, we don't support network namespaces. Uh, we, we do run always with a mount namespace, and then depending on uh, what kernel version is detected at compile time, you can kind of optionally at runtime have support for PID namespaces, uh, user namespaces, those are the only two additional ones that we support, but they're just optional additions that the user can specify if it's allowed in the configs.
um, specific, <laughs> sorry, the question is what sort of user, com I'll never, never remember, what sort of user communities are most interested right now in singularity? Uh, I would say from what I've seen, sort of high energy physics has been uh, one place that we've been using it a lot. Also in um, sort of biology research, I know that there are a couple places that have been using it. I mean, my, my work specifically, so I was at the GSI Humboldt Center in, in Darmstadt, and that's of course uh, like an Alice Center, and so they're in high energy physics, and um, at least from, from their point, they're trying to push CERN upstream to start deploying uh, in containers, and so I think that'll potentially trickle down. So the question is, I got it. <laughs> so the question is, um, I talked about not wanting to sort of rebuild our infrastructure, but what if you're at a site where they already sort of have some additional infrastructure like Kubernetes, can they still benefit from Singularity? Um, I'm not aware of the possibility of running Singularity containers from Kubernetes, uh, but I mean, as far as I know, it's it should be possible. There might need to be some work done somewhere on for like a, a plug-in support to make sure it works properly, but I don't see any reason why it wouldn't work. 